now we have Tatsalika Thierry from Cologne with us. She's going to talk about the racial. She's an architect, a cultural studies scholar, and she is interested in the relationship between architecture, space, and the racial, both as a researcher and a teacher. She was a visiting researcher at Columbia University and at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City. And she received a PhD in cultural studies from the University of Dortmund. Please welcome Tatsalika Thierry on the racial. Good afternoon, everybody. As an architect, I am trained to imagine a construction um, and its space, to design, to plan, and to realize it. However, throughout the years of becoming an architect, I had experiences and thoughts I could not catalog yet. I was aware that architecture was entangled in a fabric of, of complex cultural production beyond my educational scope. Only many years later, by then equipped with the academic toolbox of cultural studies, I was able to phrase my questions. I was interested in power in the architectural field. I was interested in the master narrative, the master narrative that I was thought, taught, the narrative of modern architecture subsuming ideas of aesthetics, including the body of knowledge and beauty. While it is an integral part within the field of cultural studies, for me as an art architect, it was quite a realization acknowledging that there are yet other fields beyond, or other aspects in human life um, beyond architecture based on the concept of construction. Thus the motif of the ever constructing human being illustrates the continuous human activity of constructing reality. The city, architecture and the racial are realities that are based on the concept of construction that is their common ground. And since all three are subject to continuous change, they're everything but static. We are taught that essentializing is a bad thing, but sometimes it can be a very helpful method if used responsibly and with the intention of clarifying matters. Gayatri Spivak, um, calls that strategic essentialism. Chemists just call it litmus test. So let me walk you through my strategically essentializing lines of thoughts. Today, I would like to share three aphorisms with you. I'm going to begin with thoughts on architecture and the racial. Relating the key process of industrialization and manufacturing to the ideological construction of man Sociologist Denise Ferreira da Silva locates the trace of the racial as a man-made concept in modernity. For her, modernity begins with the power of reason, replacing the reliance on any royal or divine sovereignty by two fields, namely science and history. This shift to modernity facilitated racial determinism entering the, into the world. Phrasing human difference through the racial is a constitutive means to organize global spaces. It actually still pervades modern thought, creating knowledge and power. And because of that, modern representation cannot be discussed without analyzing the racial. For early traces of the racial, we have to go back four centuries in time what matured into popular thinking among European philosophers in the age of the Enlightenment has transformed into a mindset to be found anywhere where Europeans left their marks. This mindset involved defining the European self as a new human against the non-European other, with the concept of the European heteronormative white male, its twin, the black other, was born. But only together, the concepts of both blackness and whiteness constitute the racial. An architectural project begins as thought, entering into a world of existing discourses, an architectural idea undergoes different phases of formation. When it materializes, it enters into a dialogue with existing architectural contexts. As a project, it is a projection of our ideas into the future. 
as a construction. This built idea will enable <coughs> corporeal experiences in built space. Besides its obvious architectural function, the corporeal encounter with, let's say, um, a bridge, as an example of architecture, includes hitting its pier or falling off its railing. The planning and construction of the bridge thus involves chances of destruction or taking risks. The very same can be said about the racial. Comparable to an architectural project emerging into the material world, the concept of the racial is constructed and it has concrete corporeal effects on human bodies too. Similar in effect, the racial sets the boundaries of mobility, in this case, social mobility. The racial can either enable or prohibit access to social, social spaces, such as class, history, or geographical space. The encounters with architectural as well as racially determined spaces can be both equally constructive, but also destructive. Here comes my second aphorism. It's about the master narrative, the racial between silencing, forgetting, construction, erasure, and resistance. When it comes to the telling of stories about the people involved in the creation of society, that are different, there are different ways of creating racialized master narratives. These narratives serve the purpose of nation building, making history or building architecture and its history and its style. Manipulating perception and the cognitive capacity of imagining knowledge systems like architecture, literature, and history have the power to create these master narratives by constructing or erasing like presence. However, resistance against this kind of erasure is possible. In my research, I looked into how the racial is used to control spaces of knowledge. I discussed texts by Toni Morrison, historians and art historians, and multi-talented founding father of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. And I found out that the first strategic step in controlling space of knowledge is identifying and racializing those elements that appear important in telling the story. In a second step, using the concept of the racial is a helpful device of creating a new master narrative with the power of influencing our repository of imagination. And I'd like to give you an example. The construction of Monticello. Darren Walker, the director of the Ford Foundation, talked about Monticello on the occasion of Juneteenth, not even two weeks ago. He called it, and I quote, the most American of places, because it represents both a monument to the nobles' ideals and the very blood-stained earth where Jefferson enslaved some 400 human beings in direct contradiction to those ideals, a paradox defined by a perverse dissonance. Mabel Wilson wrote about Monticello in her co-edited publication, Race and Modern Architecture from 2020. And she draws a relationship between race, reason, and architecture. I discussed Monticello in my soon to be published book in the context of master narratives. And 20 years ago, Craig Barton was one of the first to draw attention to the synchrony of discrepancies within the construction of Monticello. Over the past years, Monticello has become a symbol of U.S. American paradoxical duality in architectural discourse. Located in Charlottesville, Virginia, it was the primary plantation of Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. The working of the plantation was based on slavery. What we see here on this image is just, to be be just too beautiful to be questioned. Nothing should disturb this picturesque image of a prospering venture, right? And this is, where, this is where the toolbox from cultural study becomes really helpful, helpful to think critically by looking beyond this master narrative. How do we talk about this image? Is the problem what we don't see, what's not shown in this image? The double standard in its layout, for example, um, of basically two entangled floor plans um, allowing the enslaved to carry out the domestic work and circulate within the building invisible to its white inhabitants? 
or the cabins for the enslaved who ran the plantation on the far side underneath the balconies. Cabins that were, again, invisible for those standing on this beautiful porch we see right here, underneath the portico, uh, looking down the spacious garden. Or is the problem with this image of Monticello rather, and here I am quoting literary scholar N. N. Lin Cheng, sometimes it is not a question of what the visible hides, but how it is that we have failed to see certain, th certain things on the, on the surface, such as style reference to, let's say, Palladio. Here comes my third aphorism on the racial modernity and modernism. This construction of space, Monticello, this construction of its master narrative works through creating social and spatial hierarchies by differentiating between visibility and invisibility based on predefined human difference. In this case, the active denial of the presence of the black body. You might ask yourselves, what do I have to do with this? Or, this is not my history. I live today and not in the past, or even, what about this is modern? Well, here is a piece of money, a cultural artifact, a Jefferson nickel. And on that Jefferson nickel, there is this construction. So being here right now at Kochenhof number seven, we could also ask ourselves, what don't we have to do with this? That piece of money, it represents the beginnings of capitalist dynamics through the Atlantic slave trade, African bodies rendered invisible on their coin. What to think about this in terms of, let's say, issues like silencing, forgetting, erasure, construction, and resistance but also in the sense of globalization and capitalism. A piece of money is something you hold in your hands on a daily basis. Money makes our world go round with difference, the racial. It is a constitutive means organizing space and knowledge production. The power of reason marks the initial moment of modern times. And because of that, architecture as modern representation cannot be discussed without analyzing the racial. Acknowledging that modern architectural thought is based on the racial would mean consequently adapting the curriculum and teach and discuss both racialized histories and the emergence from a racial nationalist logic. And I will end with a question and an answer. Why do architects need to discuss the racial? Because it is a versatile phenomenon always connected to space. On the one hand, architecture is part of our social formations. On the other hand, architecture itself can represent or be an instrument of racialization. Thus, the simplest and at the same time, the most complex response to why architects should discuss the racial is because it unfolds in three-dimensional space. Thank you.